Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by the Nyaradza Group. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, I'm in conversation with Maud Chifamba, a chartered accountant currently on assignment with PwC. Enjoy this truly inspirational conversation. <music> Chifamba, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you so much, Trevor. Uh, I should mention that I'm honored to be here. I follow your conversations and I never really thought I would be here. <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually very surprised when you said, come to Let's Talk. So you're, I'm very honored to be here. Thank, thank you for your kind words. You know, you're here because your story to me uh, embodies the notion that uh, how we start does not determine how our lives end. Yeah and that our past actually doesn't determine our future. Yeah. You lost your father when you were five years old. Yeah. You lost your mother um, in 2011 when you were 13 years old. Yeah. So essentially you, you've grown up as, as, as an orphan. Yeah. Um, but you've gone to do such amazing work. How do you explain how your life has turned out? Um, typically, I would say Grace. Uh, where, you know, a number of things just happen, like unmerited favor just finds you. But usually when I'm in conversation with you, <laughs> and I don't want to, to say grace per se, because I feel like grace negates all the other things that have happened. So I do get that there are people who work as hard, more, th more than I do, work harder than I do, uh, people who probably deserve the chances that I got more than I did but who never got them and I did. So I do get that part. But I also don't want to discount the, uh, the hard work that it took. I don't want to discount the collaboration from strangers mm -hmm. that it took. I don't want to um, negate the community that came together for me to then get to, to where I am. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's, that would be my But idea. is that not all grace, the community, the collaboration? the people that came in to help you, and we will talk about that. Yeah. Is that not itself grace, the hand of God, the undeserved favor of God uh, moving you towards your, your destiny, towards your purpose? It is, it is. I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Okay. I, uh, I truly think it's because some of the things I cannot explain myself. However, what I don't like is the the interpretation that uh, you can just sit at home and grace will find you and one day you're going to wake up somewhere else. Probably it happens probably to prophets, mm. but uh, everyone else I think uh, you need to work while God then does the grace. Mm. Yeah. So I, I think I agree with you there. Um, at the notion that uh, you sit at home, yeah. you don't do anything, and Grace finds you end up being a doctor without going to school, that doesn't happen. Exactly. So we need to put that into context. Yes. Is that what you're saying then? Yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's a very dangerous cliche Yeah. where you ask someone, Trevor, how did you become who you are? And Trevor answers you and says, oh, it was Grace. But mm -hmm. they don't tell you, you know what? I did A, B, C, D, E, F, and Grace found me yeah. on that part. So that's what I'm trying to, to yeah. say, to say there was grace, but there were also other inputs. That okay. And to talk to me now about, we've already said, I've already said that you, you grew up largely as, as, as an orphan. Mm. Um, and you grew up really, your family circumstances, you know, for lack of a better word, poverty, yeah. difficult. Describe to us your upbringing as, 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 as far back as you can remember. Uh, how tough it was and the breaks that you did get. <laughs> We're going to go to need the whole hour. Uh, so I was born in a small village, Gokwe South. Um, my family was just doing um, peas and farming. I call it peas and farming because it was generally just to get ourselves food. Mm. Um, we didn't even have cattle to use in the field. So that's really like if you're in the rural areas and you don't have cattle, I mean, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? Um, our household was actually known for this, <laughs> like those are the poor guys. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of us, you know, mm -hmm. like in the house. Um, 
but one thing that my family always did uh, say, and I credit most of it to my dad, was if I was going to change my life or be alive, um, it was going to be through education. So I was a, I'm a firstborn, um, and um, I did feel the burden of I need to change my family's life. And um, for lack of a better word, I didn't think I had other options. Mm. So um, after being born in Gokwe, uh, up until I was five, I actually started school there, like preschool. And um, at, after the dismise, dis dismise of my father, I had to go to live in Kwekwe, which is Handes Road. And Handes Road was like, it was, so at least in Gokwe, we had family, we had community, um, and the school was very close to, to home. In Handes Road, it was, there was, it was a new resettlement area. Um, I think we got land, Ped Chimurenga, we, my family got land there. So we moved to Tarot. Your father Road. got land? No, my no, brother. Your brother, okay. Yes, the one I was now staying, mm. my older brother, yeah. half brother. So we moved to Anders Road. Um, I moved to Anders Road, basically. And um, the school was so far away. It was more than eight kilometers away. Kwamara Prison School, actually. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went there. And then, like, on the first day when I got there, I was like, you know what? This school is too far. I can't do this for seven years. Mm. Um, because I said, what if I just go there and say I'm in grade two instead of being in grade one? But I was like so tiny and for all of this and stuff. So the teacher really could tell like, this is not grade two. This, this is such a young child. So I only lasted like half a day and they asked one of my other half brother and said, um, when I'm not grade two, I know where she's coming from. Mm. I hadn't told him. <laughs> so... He said, no, 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 she was in grade one. So I went back to grade one. But at least at Conmaya, we had porridge at break time. It was so far away. So we would actually wake up around like 5 a.m. to start walking to school. And good thing is we used to get porridge at break time. Um, and then, you know, school finishes off at 12 if you're like grade one and two. But then because of the forest that was there, we couldn't go back home. So we had to wait for our older brothers and mm. sisters and we would eat all kinds of wild fruits. Looking back, it is like, I just don't know how I made it out. Mm. But back then, it was pretty normal to us. We were like normal kids just yeah. coming back from school. Then um, we then had uh, the villagers then turned... Um, a farmhouse into a school and so uh, we at least had a school that was like six kilometers mm. away but um i don't want to lie my upbringing makes me appreciate everything i have now because things were hard from getting food on the table mm. my family so handers road is not a farming place uh the white farmer was they actually used it for to keep he used to keep cattle they wouldn't do the crop farming because the there used to be droughts over there. I don't think it's actually in a region to be able to be, to sustain any crop mm. farming. So we, we would try farming, but it wouldn't work. Mm. So I remember sometimes we would actually get inputs from the government. We would wash the seed and make salsa um, because things were so hard. And then that's when my family started trying branding. Um, my brother would go to Binga, buy fish, salt them, and then would sell them along the Harablawa Road. Um, and I also used to get to, to help in the business. And also, like, after primary school, then there was no school, no high school for me to go to. So that's just, like, the, the circumstances that I grew up in. And then you're also, like, a girl, and there's, like, a rural setup. There is the turning to the fields, but there are also other things that come up. Um, the looking for water, looking for firewoods, and all those gay things, all those duties that are meant to be done by girls in the house. So I just feel like my upbringing was a lot. Mm. It was tough. Terms. It was yeah, tough. It was. Do, do you think it left? It has left scars on you. Do you feel those scars at all when you look back? Do you do that? Um, yes, I think my upbringing. Um, shaped in a way who I am so How? I grew up in a family full of boys so you notice that most times I actually tend to act like a boy I tend to I actually think even the sheer determination that I have it's so 
the first thing that I would say was that I got from my upbringing, um, my family wasn't just poor, but it was very dysfunctional, very dysfunctional. So um, from there, watching my mother and father, watching my brothers, I knew marriage was not for me. So, you know, like the community that I grew up in, even up to now, I don't have a cousin that gets up to 16. All my cousins get married before 16. It was a community where child marriage is rife. Right, so the expectation for a girl would never let send her to school, would never be let send her to school. The expectation is she will get married off, you know. Um, but for me, I knew that was not an option mm. because I watched my mother and I was like, I don't want this life. I don't want it for me. Then also the poverty drove me to say there has to be something else in life other than eating sazare green and eating sazare red. And it made me treat my education with respect. I, I, I gave it some sort of solemnity. It was solemn to me because it was a way out. And then also now being in a family with boys and being in a rural setup, and you see the boys are just sitting over there and you can't read because you have to go fetch firewood, but the boys are not interested in the reading, they're just sitting. But because it's not expected for them to be helping you fetch firewood, to be helping you with the water, to be helping you with the cooking, they get, get away with it. So I think it made me a feminist. <laughs> You, you, also, you've, you've said uh, a, a couple of interesting things, uh, yeah. Maud. One, how old were you when, when you were making this observation? Do you remember? Do you recall? From, so being taught about education, I think from the time, because the education bit came from my dad, yeah. um, and then through my brothers on later, but mainly came from my dad. But from as long as I can remember uh, four years, I would witness the dysfunction in my family. So I would say for as long as I can remember, I don't know. Wow. You, you, you know why I ask because Because yeah. that's very striking. Um, three things. One, um, as early as that, you say to yourself, marriage is not for me. Yeah, I hated my mother's life. Why? Um, I guess she was comfortable with it, but I just didn't understand why she couldn't make money for herself. Um, I didn't understand why she had to be beaten. Um, I didn't understand why she hear voice. So in my family, there's that whole diary we just the go guys go over there and then they discuss issues that are affecting everyone. So I don't understand. This woman is taking care of everyone around here and these the areas everywhere and she doesn't even have me say to say, okay, I also think this. So all those things made me feel like she was treated like less of a human. And I did not see any reason for that except that she was a wife. And, and the other thing, you, you say that you looked at it and you said um, education is going to be the way out of this. Yeah. Where had you seen education modeled as a way out of this? Okay, so my dad would come uh, home and I, as a girl, I was sort of a favorite for him. Uh, he would say, take your toothbrush, let's go brush our teeth. And uh, as we're talking, he says, do you see all those planes flying past? You know, you could be flying a, a plane. Um, and then sh he would also tell me about Dr. Condoleezza Rice. He said, there's this woman in the United States security, um, Condoleezza Rice and everything. And at this time, I didn't know who Condoleezza Rice was, but it struck me that he was mentioning a woman with so much admiration, yet my mother could not come in and talk mm. to you about things affecting the family. Wow. So you think I can fly a plane, but... That's not how you're treating my that's mom. That's how you're treating my mom. So there has to be something about that woman that my mom doesn't have that I should get. Hmm. Yeah. Then the um, really inspiring thing for me uh, as we begin is you 
your primary education. Some of us did, took seven years to do primary education. You took four years, am I right? Yeah. You did that? Yeah. This is where we say, where we were talking about grace. Um, because in that situation, uh, so as I said, I went, I started school at, in Gokwe, went to Konmara, tried to get into grade two, went back. And then, um, I think that was around 2004, um, the villagers decided, let's start up Hudrudza Primary School, which is more like we're converting a farmhouse, an old farmhouse into your school. And um, the house was taken by someone else. We had the barns or whatever the farmer used to keep his, 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 his poultry. Mm. So there weren't enough rooms for grade one to seven. So grade one and two in one class, three, four, five in another class, and grade six, seven, one in another class. We were given three teachers, um, and we were said, okay, you have a school. So by this time, I was grade two. I have a brother, Muku. Um, he was four by this time. So because there was a prerequisite number of students that was needed, they said, let everyone come to school, even the four-year-olds, they'll be going to grade one so that we have the numbers. So Muku comes into this class, and... Um, so we are very competitive because remember I'm coming from a very masculine family. family. So Mugu always thought he was better than me, right? So I needed to prove to Mugu that you're not. Because he actually used to say, I'm now your father. Since, you know, it is not the end of me. I'm now your father. So, so, when we, so now we're in the same room. We have the same teacher, although the teacher is teaching grade twos and the grade ones on the other side. And so Moku would actually like abandon his work and try to come answer questions for grade two. So that when we're at home, he could say, <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I was answering questions she didn't even know how to do. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, that, <laughs> that just did not sit well with me. So the following year, when I then went to grade three, I was now in a different class. You're much more senior than that. Than Muku, because now the grade one and two classroom was separate. So now he was now in grade two. I was in grade three, but I was in a different room. Mm. So um, happens, I don't think, I, I wasn't told about it, but I do think it was deliberate from one of my teachers. Uh, his name is Misty Vimisai. He gives me a grade four question paper, because remember we're in the same classroom. Mm. We're learning different things, but we're in the same room. So... He said it was a mistake he gave because we're not in the same room. Mm. Uh, but I get a grade four paper um, <laughs> and I score, it was a math paper and I was naturally good with numbers. I score 100% in this paper. So I'm like, oh, this is an opportunity for me to run away from Muku. <laughs> so the next day, I ask him, like, you know what? I was number one in grade four last day. Uh, I did well in that work, paper. Can I write my exams with grade fives? So I'm like, okay, fine. Let's give it a try. So they actually thought it was just me just trying to write exams. So I just wrote exams with grade fives, became number one in grade five. Wow. Uh, so the following year, uh, everyone thought I was going to grade four mm -hmm. because I was coming from grade three. But I thought, but I was number one in grade five, so I should be going to grade six. Mm -hmm. And the teacher sat me down, They're like, you know what, um, school is not just about you being able to figure out problems for your grade. It's also about socialization, being with your peers. But being with my peers meant I was going to be with Muku in the same <laughs> class again. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, uh that will not work. I put on a show, um, said I'm no longer coming to school. And, you know, they said, you know, I just, there's no harm in trying. Let I go. That's when I go. then went to grade six, then grade seven. Wow. Thank you. And as a result, uh, Maud, you uh, have been listed, I mean, as uh, the youngest uh, university uh, student in Africa. You, yeah. you, you went to university 14 years old. Yeah. Um, you, and this is noted in the Book of African Records. Yeah. Uh, the youngest uh, graduate at 18 years old. The youngest MSc graduate at uh, 20 years old. Am yeah. I right? Yeah. How does that make you feel? Now it's normal. <laughs> now it's normal. Uh, but it makes me very grateful for, um, for how life has turned out. Yeah. As Nyaradzo, we strive to continuously bring convenience to our clients. Nyaradzo Group is proud to introduce Sawi, a new virtual chatbot assistant on WhatsApp. 
With Sawi, you are now able to interact with us from the comfort of your home and can be assisted anytime via WhatsApp. With life assurance products, diaspora products, applying and assessing your policy, payment platforms, claims information and any other queries concerning payments, policy information or products and services. Simply WhatsApp Sawi on plus 263-712-992892 or register and start interacting and receiving notifications from Sawi on WhatsApp. Now, join in and experience a new level of convenience 24 hours a day with Sawi. Right now, you are um, a senior audit consultant yeah. uh, signed by SAPRO to uh, PwC. Yeah. Um, talk to me about, and I, you, you're working remotely, isn't it? Yeah. And you're auditing uh, uh, Meltwater, yeah. a social media company valued with turnover of US 312 yeah. million uh, US dollars. You're working remotely. Talk to me about what the assignment looks like. and. So, um, before this, I did have, um, I did my articles with Deloitte, which yeah. is more of a, I would say the biggest firm in Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so I did, I, I do have over four years experience now in order. So this is more just like um, a transition. Um, and the, tr the reason why I chose to be remote is because I do, I do work with Zimbabwe Youth Council. I do work with. Uh, youth in Zim and I also have like family obligations um, that I felt I needed to do before I can leave the country mm. so the remote working sort of fit with where I am with, um, with in my life and also does help that the US is a different time zone so I get to be in conversation with you like this mm. on mm. a Tuesday mm -hmm. <laughs> And then still get to work. Okay, so it's your choice to be in Zim. You could be um, in San Jose. Oh yeah! Oh, oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! When I qualified, like, I when I qualified, I actually wanted to go to the UK. Um, got jobs actually. I think even almost started the visa process. Then I realized um, there was a great exodus of newly qualified general accountants going to the UK. And this sort of became the normal thing. So you qualify, you go kuchando as we call it. You go kuchando, you come back. But then when I really looked at it based off my own circumstances, my own personal journey and what I, what I envisioned my life to look like, I then realized um, it wasn't the best choice at the time. It's still not the best choice. When it becomes the best choice for me to relocate, I will, but for now it's not. That's interesting. That's not how a lot of young people view things. Is that choice primarily determined by the fact that your family responsibilities? Talk to me about that. We could say maybe I'm patriotic. <laughs> okay, all right, that's fine too. <laughs> it's just a lot of factors that, yeah. that need me to be here for okay. now. Let, let's go back to why you chose and how you chose to be a chartered accountant, how you chose to study accountancy at the University of Zimbabwe. Where did the influence come from? Um, money, <laughs> looking for money. That's been very frankly, honest, yeah. eh? Uh, <laughs> so, my older brother used to say, you're going to school for money. What's the best way to find money than to study money? Because every company, uh, you used to say, even mines need, need geologists to find minerals. By the end of the day, they need a geologist to make the money. So if you start money, you never go wrong. But anyway, <laughs> the reason why I went into accounting is, um, so as I said, when we moved to Anders Road, the, my family's way of living changed. We became more of um, vendors. And then even when we moved to Chegutu, we were selling oranges cabbages, biscuits, a lot of things at the time, salt. Czech good people actually know us as salt. Um, because we're so salt. <laughs> but, um, so I, I got so much involved in, um, in business. So what we would actually do as a family is, as we got older, um, we would sit down, you know what, 
we can buy salt from Lyo and sell it. Um, Muko was very good with the selling. He's what is Muko doing, by the way, now? Says he's a businessman. Says he's a businessman. <laughs> he's still running the farm? Emphasis on says. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We we lost the, the farm. The farm. When we moved to, to Chegutu, we kind of lost it. And that's okay. Mm. Um, but we did... We do go back here and there just to check on the community because I also do a lot of work with the community. Um, so um, when the model changed and it became business, we would always talk about, you know what, we can buy this here and sell it here at this price. And I still think that's why Muku is more into that life. Uh, but for me, it always didn't make sense how we sit down, this business is going to make sense, but at the end of the day, we don't have rent money. <laughs> that we don't have food. So where's all the profit going? Mm. So I, wo I grew a keen interest in uh, studying how businesses work. Mm. So when I went to A-level and um, uh, they asked me what combination do you want, I actually told them the only subject I'm sure about is business studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, oh, if you're going to do business studies, that's a core subject for commercials. That means you're going to study commercials. I actually wanted to do business studies, divinity and geography, I think. And I said, there's no combination like that. So you can start to study accounting. So I actually picked up accounting at A-level. I started studying accounting at A-level. Um, then after I finished my A-level, uh, the University of Zimbabwe, the Vice Chancellor says, uh, here are the, um, the degrees that we have here at the university. Which one would you like to, to study? Because you said, if you want to study engineering, I'll understand, I'll give you engineering. Because um, you're so young, I was only 14. You can start off a fresh page and start over. Such a kind man. Then uh, I chose accounting. But after that, I actually wanted to go or, like do something else. Until to my mafunga, current president of ICAS. He wasn't president then. He was a partner at Deloitte. Reached out to me and said, oh, I'm, I'm working at Deloitte. Um, I'm a partner. I would like to discuss you becoming a chartered accountant. I think chartered accountant. What is a chartered accountant? Mm, like, mm. I've heard people talk about it, but I don't know what it is about. So he says, come through to my office. Let's talk. So it was Tumai and um, Anne Sudaka, owner of Chartered Accountants Academy. They called me. So this is where the other grace comes. Like those people just reaching out to me, and I don't even know wow. know them. Wow. Um, so, but then still, at some point, I was still I wasn't still sold. I was saying I was going to go to business school. I wasn't interested in going um, being a chartered accountant. Till one day, <laughs> to my calls me like, "What do you care the most about in life?" I'm like, "Oh, I care about my family. I care about Muku. I need to take care of Muku and A B C D because he's younger than me, and you know, like you become the deputy parent." Um, then he says. Do you know if you become a chartered accountant, you'll be able to take Muku for coffee to Paris? I'm like, oh, sign me up. <laughs> sign me up. Right. That's how I then started talking at Deloitte. Um, then we, we then settled on my offer, got a contract, um, did my articles with Deloitte, and the experience changed my life. How? Started talking to my salad, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> People from up market <laughs> doing this channel account because this is from Saint Yoko. We don't know. We were this rural. What do, what do they call us, by the way? Strong, strong rural, rural backgrounds. backgrounds. Yeah, yes, you and I, yes, we, yes, we qualify yes. for that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But now you're showing up and you're you're in a career that is being done by people in the out up market. You know, it's kind of. I feel like articles they forced me to grow up. They provided me an environment where it was also okay to be very young. Uh, I'd been in corporate before, like for a few months, but whatever, uh, working with older people and, you know, like everyone just discounting you off the basis of your because young. young. But if I show up at your companies and all the time, even if I'm 17, you're going to listen to what I'm saying, you know. So it allowed me to be young and it, it gave me the room to actually grow in quite a supportive um, environment. environment and also an environment where the fact that you're young is not special because everyone is young so you get to but i'm sure you it. were the youngest <laughs> yeah the, the youngest probably the youngest ca but at Deloitte, i wasn't the youngest because they take people straight from high school so you have your it 18 right, year yeah, olds there yeah. i already had a master's when i started off at Deloitte, so I was finishing it off. Yeah, I think I was finishing it off when I started off. So there was no that thing associated with 
the thing that's defining you is you're young because everyone around is young. Um, so you can get to authentically be yourself. And I had been at that point where it was the peak almost of media attention on me, which is sort of defining who I was. So it felt very good to be in a space where I could be young and no one wants to write about it. <laughs> How did that make you feel, being young and getting this media attention? Talk to me about what that did to you. Was it a good thing? Did you like it? I wouldn't, I don't think, well, not trying to clip God's powers, but I don't think I would be where I am with other media. Um, because the first time I went to apply it, she said, they said to me, Teja Zukere Kumba Munokura. Like this lady wow. said that to me, and they said the system could not process my application. Wow! Uh, so there was no way they were going to be able to offer me a place. So this is just like people in the admin uh, uh, making these decisions. Um, but it was only after the article uh, by I think it was Feluna. It was actually in the Newsday uh, about fourteen-year-old wants to study at the University of Zimbabwe that even the vice chancellor got to know about me, and you know, so sort of think. If you want to study here, come through, we'll even offer you a scholarship. But the admin people had said you're I, too I, young. They had rejected my application and said the system will not be able to process this ATC. And I'd actually given up until wow. the news crew showed up at my house and said, um, my brother just came in and said, oh, they didn't even know. They were like, oh, no, no, we're from the news day. We want to write your story. And then they wrote my story in the news day. And then that changed sort of my life. Um, but it did come with also a lot of other things. Like what? Uh, like when I was at UZ, I was like a zoo animal. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like everyone just like, oh, the 14 year old, oh, the 14 year old, like, oh my goodness, can I just be? Um, like the first days, I really was like a zoo animal. Everyone wanted to come see the 14 year old. And also. Has that zoo animal phenomenon faded away? Is yes, it gone? With age. People are yes. used to. <laughs> okay. Yes, and also like me then growing up, um, the age thing doesn't really. You know, like being at uni at 14 was. Wow. It was like something people huge. have never seen. That's huge. Yeah, so. I was, I, I was at uni at. Um, at 18, if not 20 or 21, I can't yeah. remember. Yeah, so most people were so at 19. So that's seven years older than you when yeah. you went to Yeah, so I wasn't even like close in age with my, my, my classmates to even be friends with them. Um, but you were still acing the, the school, <laughs> the education. Yeah, it's a different thing. <laughs> you know, like school is different from social yeah. relations. Yeah. But yeah, um, the... The media did that for me, um, and I'm quite grateful for it. But it came with like being the zoo animal, yeah. and also it invited a lot of opinions, mm. a lot of opinions. Such as? So you see, just like two men reached out to me with, do you want to be a CA? There were a lot of people also with their own paths that they thought I should take. I see. Especially now, even now, some people still think, you know, you should have been in engineering, wasted brains, you know, why are you in accounting? And what's your response to that? And then as a dad, I don't need to leave for my life to make sense to someone else. Okay. It has to make sense to me. And with the journey that I had to walk through, it made sense for me to go to accounting. And you don't have to be an engineer to make sense. I mean, like, we, write, we, we live and every day you, 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 are, you are affected by the economy. Mm. That's not really an issue. So you are, you are entirely happy with the choices Very. you've made? You're comfortable in Very. your body? Very. You've also had grace in terms of uh, the, the Minister of Education coming in to support you, uh, Zimbabwe Revenue Authority coming in to support you. That was huge also. It was. Talk to me about those breaks. My sponsorship journey is actually a journey. Um, one time, um, so all along I was supported by, by my family. And then we got to A-level and then the fees, I think, became a bit too much for them. Remember, we didn't even have rent yeah, sometimes. Yeah. So. The fees became too much for them, and I think the first the first attempt at me getting a scholarship was this, you know, like those classified ad, um, like in the financial gazette. Um, so they sent through an ad and said we're looking for support for a 12 year old doing A level. 
<laughs> who did that for you? My brother, my elder wow. half brother. So you put it there. Then we did get some responses. Uh, someone from okay, I won't say their name. <laughs> Why not? Like Why not? They don't want to be named. Um, so, like, <laughs> so we came. This person says, oh, you know what? I'm a chief executive officer at a company. Um, I can help you with fees. Come to Harare. Come to Harare. Meet a stranger. Uh, then this stranger says, we actually said, come through the holiday in That one over there by fifth. We went there, um, first time in a hotel, seeing pools, swimming pools. I'm like, oh wow, this is going to be life. Um, buy this lunch, I think it was chicken, fork and knife situation. I've never eaten using a fork and knife. I'm like, oh my goodness, this man must be moneyed. Um, he asked me, so what subjects are you studying? I'm like, oh no, no, I'm studying business studies, accounts, and math, because I was doing, that was my combination. I was like, okay, fine, do you mind if I ask you business studies questions? I guess because he was a CEO. So you asked me, I answered them, he's like, okay, fine, fine. Um, I will send money for you uh, in the coming week. As we are gating outside Holiday Inn, like as we're leaving, so he gives me 20 bucks, gives my brother 20 bucks. I go, find your way home. It's only three dollars to check it. So we're like, oh my God, we made a win. <laughs> uh, then as we're leaving Holiday Inn, this man's brother or friend, Shows up. He's like, oh, hey, how are you? Good to see you. He's like, oh, I need to tell you about this girl that I've been talking to, mentioning me. Yeah. Then this friend says, don't you think you're being scammed? By you. Yes, like, there's no way I was phone five. I was really tiny at that time. I understand. So we went back home. We, we managed to buy time saying, oh, we made a sponsor and you know what? I'm going to, they're going to pay the money. Money never, never came. Never came. So we bought time at school probably two weeks and um, it never came. But, so I was not in and out of school. Whenever they would send people back home, I would just go back home. Because you, you didn't, you hadn't paid school fees. I didn't get, yeah, my fees wasn't paid. So I'm in and out of school. But then there was also this phenomenon that when I was coming to school, I was only 12. So I would be sewing clothes for my little dolls back at home, although I was A level. So this teacher, we used to learn math in the computer lab. This teacher wasn't even my teacher, but he was the science teacher, I think biology. Um, and he, he not, you used to notice that today there's a math lesson. This lady is not there. This child is not there. Then the other day she's there. So she, he actually thought it was because I was being playful or whatever it was. So he set me down. He's like, why are you always in and out of class? How come I can see you the other day? And then the other day I don't see you. And then I explained to him, it's because my fees is not paid. I'm like, oh, I think someone must be able to pay your fees. So he was disabled and he had trouble finding a job. And you could only get a job after your story was written. So he says, I can contact the person who wrote my story and they can write your story. And then um, Brian Chifamba, not related, came through Chichagutu, wrote my story. After that, I got um, uh, somebody uh, just sent money for fees, uh, bought me wow. new uniforms, wow. um, said, you know what, I don't really need to meet you. I can just help you. So... When we left Holiday in the other time and um, help couldn't come, my brother told me, you know what, God will raise tones to help you if you're meant to be helped. And all of a sudden, all this is now happening. Um, the next year, we was stranded. I couldn't even go up to school even though fees was paid because of a situation at home. Um, then out of nowhere, the district education officer, um, Mr. Joe, I think was his name, it's like, um, hi. So the previous year I presented like a speech. It's like, hi, is there anything that I can do to help you? I'm like, yes, you come at the perfect time because I'm not in school and my little brother is not in school. He's like, no, 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 we'll help you. Um, so he gets BSPZ. So he says BSPZ is going to better is, schools pro BSP better schools programs in Babu. It's under the Ministry of Education. BSPZ is going to help you with your fees. So they help me. They take me to Sandringham and um, my little brother to Modeli. And I think that was just for a term. After that, Zimplatz comes in and pays my fees. 
And then when we went, when I was about to go to university, I don't remember what happened with this implants, it just fell through and I didn't have scholarship. So uh, Professor Nyagura from UZ said, I'm offering you a place and full board if no one comes in. Then that's when Commissioner General Pasi comes in with the Zimra Charity Fund. Wow. So it's just been things that you cannot explain, just stars coming when there's darkness, then oh, at the end of the day, there's like a light coming through. What has that done to you, seeing these doors opening up without you doing anything, hey? Uh, journalists pitch up at your, yeah. at your doorstep. Yeah, they, and they did. What, what, does that, what has that done to you in terms of how you view, you view life? It has, it has done two things. Uh, the first thing is it has um, solidified in me the faith that I'm going to be okay, uh, whatever comes my way. Whatever challenge comes my way, I'm going to be fine. And the second thing is it has made me so grateful and made me want to be that person because I know how it feels that there is gloom and then all of a sudden a star appears. So it has made me want to be the star because I know exactly how it feels to be the person who receives the star. Yeah. And um, how are you doing that? Oh, I try to help people in uh, situations like mine. Uh, people that I have, I have, if they, if, if information comes to me, like uh, there's a bright child needing assistance, there's uh, what, what, what happening. So I do a lot of matching because now I'm, if I call Trevor, Trevor's going to pick up the call. Mm -hmm. So I do match, like Trevor has capacity to sponsor one person. And I know one person who needs fees. So Trevor, can you sponsor this person? This person would have never So you are paying you. it forward, is it? Yes. What society, what life gave to you, you're paying it forward. Yeah, yeah. Because Trevor would never met this person because unlike me, they're not in the newspaper. But they do deserve to also get their help. So I do that matching people. I also try to help people. Like my YouTube channel, that's the whole thing. Um, to try and give people information because I had access to that information like I can I mean like what are the odds that a partner in a big four is gonna call you mm. and give you all this information they're close to zero mm. so I try to also pay it forward giving you information oh there's this career that you don't know about that you can do um, and then also like try to do things around the basics because sometimes people get um, we help people with fees, but there are so many other factors around them that are not fees that can actually make that. What fees are those go away. factors? What are those factors? Like, if you pay fees for me, I'm still gonna need food. I'm still gonna need uh, rent if I'm in an area. I'm still gonna be like a girl at university. I'm still gonna feel uh, all those pressures. I'm still gonna need all that other support that is outside just you paying the fees, and. I try to help with that as well. You you doing quite a lot of work still with your old school, Huruza Primary School. Yeah. You're doing a lot of uh, community work. Um, that is part of your pay, paying it forward. I'm a Christian, and I believe in the story of Esther. So Esther managed somehow to become queen when she wasn't even needed. She wasn't even in the tribe that qualified to be a queen. So somehow. She qualified. She managed to become a queen, and um, there is a decree that uh, the the Jews were meant to be uh, killed. And her cousin of some sort, Mordecai, comes and says, "Esther, you need to go into the king and stop this." And Esther says, "But you know that I'm I'm not meant to go to see the king unless the king calls for me." And Mordecai says, um, "You are. We will fast for you." and you go see the king. And Esther was a bit hesitant. And Mordecai said, what if you were made queen for a time like this? So I feel like, what if God was making me go through all this? Because I do have people that were number one in their classes at Wurudza Primary School that have not managed to make it out of that life that probably deserved the chance as well. They had the same composite classes that they could have been given that paper. Um, but what if God chose me so that I could reach out to people like that? So I just feel like it's part of my life purpose. My career is in finance. I love finance. I love, I love what I do. Uh, but I also think 
this is also part of my life purpose. Oh, wow. Yeah. And one thing that you're passionate about is empowering women and girls to speak. Yeah. You started a uh, Toastma Toast Toastmasters Club when you were still with Deloitte. Oh yeah, we started um, a Toastmasters Club with Deloitte. That's interesting. I always have this view of accountants as not as exciting as you, as boring people. Oh they, my God, they, we <laughs> need to change that. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there you were, empowering women um, to speak up. And actually, you know, uh, public speaking and, 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 and training people to be able to do public speaking, something that you're passionate about. Yeah. Talk to me about that passion. There is this book that I was reading. Um, it's called 12 Rules for Life. Um, and it talks about we need to accept that inequality exists. It was more of, sort of talking about how um, gender is a societal construct. And the author was more of saying, we need to accept that gender equality is sort of exists naturally. It's not society. Yeah. It's natural. And one of the things that he was saying when he was now defending the, that notion was how, um, for example, the pay gap is be, is not because people, organizations outrightly set out to pay women less. It's just that men negotiate more because it's part of who they are. So. I think it's, to some extent it's true, as women we are taught to be uh, soft, to be amicable, to not like conflict, to be accepting. And if women are going to survive in the jungle that is the corporate world, you're going to need to be able to stand up for yourself. You're going to need, because I feel like we can claim uh, we want those, what do they call them? Those seats that are like tokens, like we want representation and everything. But like, I don't really believe, I get what it's trying to achieve, but I don't yeah. really believe in, in gender equality being achieved that way. Mm. Because then the you end up as a token that no one respects. We all know you're here to, to balance the numbers. Yeah. Because no man just comes here and says, because I'm a man, make me see you all. They, they, they earn it and it's a jungle, right? So women need to be taught to survive in that jungle. And this goes against the nurturing that they are given. You can't be soft in order. The client will not give you stuff. You can't be soft when you're negotiating a salary because I mean, it's a business. They're trying to lessen their costs as much as they can. So I think it's very important to teach women to take up some of these um, to pick up some of these skills that society might not have naturally taught them. As Nyaradzo, we strive to continuously bring convenience to our clients. Nyaradzo Group is proud to introduce Sawi, a new virtual chatbot assistant on WhatsApp. With Sawi, you are now able to interact with us from the comfort of your home and can be assisted anytime via WhatsApp. With life assurance products, diaspora products, applying and assessing your policy, payment platforms, claims information, and any other queries concerning payments, policy information, or products and services, Simply WhatsApp Sawi on plus two six three seven one two double nine two eight nine two or register and start interacting and receiving notifications from Sawi on WhatsApp. Now join in and experience a new level of convenience 24 hours a day with Sawi. You've, you've gotten a number of uh, accolades already. Um, I mean, we've spoken about you being the youngest at 14, mm -hmm. at 14 years old. But as you get going with your life, uh, Forbes, uh, you know, awarded you the title of uh, 100 Young Powerful Women in Africa in 2012. Yeah. That's huge. Thank you. Um, and then, um, how old were you in 2012? 14. 14. Yeah. Wow. And then uh, top 100 most influential Zimbabweans under 40 um, in 2019. You were so way of 40. <laughs> <laughs> and my question to you is, you've achieved so much. You have, you have uh, been the zoo girl. Uh, you have uh, been admired and that kind of stuff. What's the, what's the biggest goal that you're aiming for? What's the next big thing for Maud Chifamba? Uh, right now, I'm just 
much. Okay, if I'm gonna be honest, I took a break from being nervous. <laughs> For like a year or two, I just want to be young. Um, I just want to be 24. I don't, my life has been so fast paced. Yeah. Um, like three months after articles, I was already like finance exec. Like everything is just fast, 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 fast. Uh, but at this point, I just want to be young. Um, I just want to be 24. I just want to enjoy everything. We have worked so hard, uh, everything that has come to to fruition for now but I do hope to continue with my community work because for the career I don't really care so much now going forward but I want to be more involved in community and impact work work that actually changes people's lives and um, if I can balance both my finance career and that work then that would be good um, like I just want to be as I said I've had stars that have come along my path. And I just want to be that path, that star on someone's mm, path mm. Uh, going forward and try to use the little influence that I have for good change. Um, do you think or do you get the sense that, like you said, your life has been fast paced? Yes. You are 24, yeah. but you're 24 and you've achieved what some of us at 50 have not achieved, for some of us at 60 have not achieved. Thank Do you. you get the sense that you've missed being playful, being a child? Do you think you've missed it? That's why I'm still playful now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did feel that mm. uh, at some point that I missed part of uh, my childhood and um, my teachers always used to warn me, even I always said that, if you, you can skip grades, we really can't skip the, the stages of life, mm. which is why I'm saying for this year and probably next year, I'm just taking a step back to just be young and not do anything wow. while changing so that I can also, that's I think I have afforded myself the chance it? to be 24. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, so like mm. if you go on my, I feel like on my social media, if you go like on my LinkedIn or my Facebook, I'm like a serious person. But if you go on my Instagram, I'm like the most playful person there is. Like that's important. It is. It yes. is important for me. Part and, of your growth. And I don't like how when I do that, um, the next thing you see it's on my viral. The next thing you see like <laughs> like it's all over. But all I'm just trying to do is to be young my my daughter who i loved so dearly she's 16 years old she's turning 16 next mm. month and uh when she was packing to go back to school yeah. um, um yesterday she says oh dad adulting is so difficult <laughs> how is she adulting at she's 16, 16. Well, oh my because goodness. she was having to pack is is adulting is. that challenging for you it is yes adulting is hard like for everyone but for me Maybe because I didn't never, I didn't really get to be like a child. Yeah. So it's not really like there's been a change. Um, I've been trying to take care of my family since like when I went to university and everything. So I've really been an adult for like the past 10 years. So not really like, oh my goodness, this is this new concept. You've been I, an adult six, four, since 14 years <laughs> yes. old. Yes. So, so I've been an adult. So it's like I'm, I'm, I'm used to, to, to adulting. And they're kind of, I feel like my adulting gets to be a bit easier uh, because of, Except when people write about me on my fire. <laughs> but um, I do think um, I get that privilege to, I have a lot of mentors, I have a lot of advice from people, and um, even some of the things that used to get me down. How, get me how down important anymore. is mentoring for you? It is so important because it's more like you're riding on the shoulders of somebody who has been there before, um, and you don't have to figure out everything for yourself because somebody figured it out back then. Um, they say that wise people learn from other people's mistakes and other people's journeys. And so you're really being spared from making the mistakes for you to see what it's gonna turn out like. So I do enjoy my conversations with my mentors. I also think like before you get into a mentorship, uh, it's also important to very much define who you are because it's very easy to then live someone else's life. Mm, to say Trevor yeah. is my mentor, so I'm just gonna do everything Trevor says. And you kind of sort of, not remember who you are and what is it that you care about because you and Trevor are probably ter two different people that care about different things. But it's always good to have someone to bounce off ideas of, to put you back into perspective um, and to just give you that wisdom from before. Yeah. You know, one thing I, I saw 
uh, passionately believe in is reverse mentoring, okay. which is young people mentoring old ones like us. Because, uh, and as you're talking to me right now, you're actually mentoring me. Oh, thank you. And I wish as a society we could do lots of that because I think uh, adults have a lot to learn from, from young people. Your perspective in a boardroom, your perspective in a, in a corporate changes the mood and changes uh, the culture of the environment. Do, do, what do you think about that? I totally, I totally um, agree. Um, I once said the saying that um, young, young people think old people are foolish yeah. and old people know young people to be foolish, which might have made sense back then. But I just feel like with the generations changing, there's just a lot that we both can learn uh, from each other. And I also think like if you work in older, um, you actually know this because like the way to, t to address a risk can come from like a level two and you're a whole level seven and you didn't really think about things in that way. So I think we now live in a society where ageism needs to go, where a perspective, a new perspective, a new idea, um, the breakthrough can come from the young person or from an, from an older person. Yeah, absolutely. So learning can go both ways. Either way, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So just, just to sum up, um, 2018 up to the present moment, you have been a part-time lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe. Um, you've been Deloitte Africa Brand Ambassador from, from 2018. Um, Deloitte, you won in Deloitte um, uh, Partners Performance uh, Notch. Uh, audit Supervisor with Deloitte 2018 to 2021. Technical Manager with uh, uh, TAS. Yeah. Um, when, you know, leading a team of 16. Finance Director at INSCO. Uh, at a young age, le leading a team of uh, 23, which is why I'm saying at 24, <laughs> you've accomplished what 68 olds have not been able to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you. I, I must ask you this. I mean, uh, you're 24 years old. You've done so much. Have you ever failed? Have you ever failed? I did. What, what, where did you fail? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I failed my first attempt at Form 4. You did? Yes, Why? I did, and I wish I could speak about this from the top of Joiner City. Talk to, tell us about it. <laughs> you, because you people failed assume your it first... was a smooth sail. Okay. So, after 2000, and, I think 2007, that's when I wrote my grade 7. Yeah. Uh, then 2008, uh, there was no high school for me to go to. We did try to get me into some high school. My family tried, but... It was never going to be sustained because it was in town yeah. and everything. So I was not back home and there was no money for me to go to school and I was just starting on my own. So I said to my family, uh, I'm going to ride for four uh, in that year. First I was like, are you crazy? But remember 2008 was the height of yeah, hyperinflation. Yeah, yeah. So the money was like worth... Um, nothing. Nothing, like two loaves of bread or something. So they did register for me. And I went to write, I went into that to register with my birth certificate uh, because I didn't have an ID. And I don't even understand why those people didn't know about passports. Mm. <laughs> it's a positive <laughs> identification because I was an external candidate and yeah. um, they needed positive identification. But I did go with my birth certificate and I wrote that exam. I remember we wrote even on, <laughs> we wrote it actually in December, I think. Then results did not come then my family now moved to chegotu results did not come up until june 2009 so the government said in around feb march use your form form for second term report books to go to school i didn't have a form for part term two report book so one of my brother's friends now had like a colleague because now we're in chegotu said oh let her come through to do form five because everyone is fascinated okay there's this 12 this i was actually 11 at the time this 11 year old says they're going to do uh form four form four form five come through so i walk in there and now remember i'm still so young i am a zoo animal like everyone is just like okay cool so i go on for like two three months as a form five killing it in business studies because i was only doing business studies. i said i would choose other subjects when the results came and results came <laughs> And you failed. And I had failed. <laughs> <laughs> and what did that failure do to you? It was embarrassing.
embarrassing mm. because you've been a zoo animal and everyone is just looking at you like some with admiration some with what does she think she's doing and all of a sudden it's a fail so this brought you down to mother earth it did it did so i actually failed and <laughs> yeah that was the most embarrassing experience <laughs> <laughs> so is that the most embarrassing failure that you've experienced there, Maud? I think so, because it was so loud, like yeah, everyone yeah, could see yeah. it. So um, after that, then I regrouped and went to, 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 to rewrite. I rewrote in 2009 and then passed. But so stop. having failed the way you did and embarrassing as, as the way it was, how important do you think failure is? It is. It gives us down to it. It, does, it tells it? us that we're not invincible. And... It also makes us appreciate the good things because at any time something could have gone wrong. Oh wow! Your story um, is such an empowering story. Thank you. Um, it's such an inspirational story, and like I said, it's a story that uh, that debunks the notion that where we start or the way we start is going to be the way we're going to end. Yeah. Uh, you start off in a poor family uh, as an orphan without parents and you end up where you are right now, completely rewritten uh, your life journey as it were. I have no doubt that your story is going to inspire quite a lot of people. Thank um, you. I hope that you continue being playful, uh, being naughty, um, you know, being the, cha being the the child, being a child. Please, please do that. So Maud, I know you're busy. Um, I'm grateful that you found the time to, to be on the show. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much for, for inviting me, Trevor. Um, I really enjoyed this and I hope the, your viewers enjoy it and I just need to warn your viewers anybody who is going to talk and nicely because one of the things that media has done for me was it brought all those amazing things but uh, the other thing that brought was um, negative opinions mm. so you see I'm dark if you but, see but my I'm brother, you. <laughs> you're a man, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See, my brother yeah. is light. Okay. And he's a beautiful man. Mm. So growing up, I've always had been compared with my brother. Like, oh, this should have been the goal. You know, like people mean the, like it's, they say it in the most innocent of ways. Like... This should have been the goal. But it's hurtful. But it's hurtful to me because what are you saying about me? Because I am the goal. What are you saying? And then you get thrown into the media. And it doesn't help that when I started off, I was doing English card things. <laughs> so I was literally a boy. And I understood that. But it didn't help that. Most people found it the only thing that they wanted to comment on. Like, oh. Was your... Yes. Uh, so it's body shaming. It is body shaming, and I see it with a lot of women, and I get that people get a kick out of it. Uh, people, and sometimes like people don't have filters, and it's social media. You think it's on your phone. You don't know that on the other end is an human actual being, person. What does it do to you? What has it done to you? It really did knock off. Um, so from an, an early age, before it was even through the phone, as I said, I've always been compared with Muku, Muku being the beautiful girl, the beautiful boy. boy, and I being the girl that was supposed to be the boy. Um, what it did is it made me not care so much about looks, which protected me at that time. I actually think if I was the beautiful Muku, probably I would have found a rich husband to marry me off at 13 or something. <laughs> so I think, it, I think it protected me. Oh. But um, as you get older and you become more of a woman, you start to care oh. about what people think. And people writing about those things, it really hurts. It does. Because I know it's, you're probably somebody I'm never going to meet. But why do you feel the need to say that? How do you benefit how do you benefit from it? And I've never really talked about it except in one um, Facebook post. But I see it happen with so many women. So you, you bring a very powerful guest. Per a person is talking about a powerful story, beautiful nuggets, everything that you can get out of. And all the person is going to think about is comment about their outfit, comment about their looks. But, but I, th I think we... we the way we ought to deal with that, and I'm glad you raised this issue, mm. uh, is the realization that 
the comment says nothing about you. Yeah. Says nothing about me as a dark person, but it says a lot about the person who's made it. Yes. And I think we, we need to, uh, at least I try and do that, to say, it's got nothing to do with me. That's your opinion. That's what you think about me. But that's not who I am. And it's and, really and not you warranted. Yeah. It, it's the ugliness in the person who's written the comment. They're projecting the ugliness inside of them. Yeah, but I do feel like as human beings, we owe each other grace. Absolutely. We owe each other kindness. And people say, um, when you have nothing to say, don't say nothing it. nice to say, mm. don't say it. And I feel like I just needed to point out the the effect that people don't realize that you're making your comment in the comfort of your bed, but an actual real person on the other end of the screen is going to read it. I see it a lot. With, it's not just me. That's why I'm mentioning yeah. it. Like you see Linda post something. All people choose to talk about no. is her looks. You see beautiful, beautiful girls, Tammy Moyo and Anita. You see Paige is busy who is more beautiful, but you're not focusing on their craft. And you're going to bring down two queens over who do you, you want somebody to put an opinion of who is more beautiful. And I think people just don't realize how much it does to a person's esteem. I've grown past it. I mean, it's been 10 years in this game, so yeah. I don't get moved. Yeah. But I just, I, just, I just wanted to put it out there that people just need it, to be it's, kind. It's a hugely important yes. uh, thing. I mean, I was watching something yesterday with my wife on the damage that Instagram has done to young people. So it, it's a huge factor that we ought to be dealing with. Yeah. If we had leadership in this country, it's a matter that we ought to be talking about we as do. a society. So I'm grateful you raised that issue. Up. Tell me, we love books on this show. Uh, and uh, what books have you read that you'd want to share with our viewers at, uh, at, at home. Uh, apologies to the non-Christian community. The first book that has changed my life is the Bible. Uh, the Bible just has so many nuggets. Um, it's ancient wisdom. You get anything that you actually go through, somewhere in the Bible it's talked about. So it's just like an important guide in, in life that um, you, never, you never go wrong with. For fact, like my brother, when I went to university, printed out the Ten Commandments for me and gave them to me and said, um, if you keep God's law, you keep your life. And it, that is very true. Like, the Bible fights in your corner and you, you get to learn and understand a lot of things and sometimes con get confused as well. But <laughs> it, Plenty <laughs> times. I mean, I read the Bible every day, you know, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. it do, does have um, a lot of good precept. Um, then the other book that I think is very good to read is The 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Mm. I made reference to mm. it before. Um, it talks about just these 12, 12 rules, like uh, fix your posture. Once you walk into a room confident, people assume you know what you're doing. Um, um, master your own craft before trying to get into other people's uh, craft. So that like your comparison, you're comparing, the best comparison you have is not someone else's life. The best comparison you have is your own life. The person you were yesterday talks about teach your children to abide by society's rules or society is going to teach them. Uh, talks about, you need to accept that gender inequality, you need to inequality. accept that inequality actually exists. exists. Um, it talks, and do something about it, I suppose. Yeah, and, mm. do, and actually understand. So once you understand how inequality exists, you know how to deal with yeah. it. It also even says that you need to define your problems so that you can deal with them. So once a problem is no, you can deal with it. And then um, the um, other book is, I think, uh, Tiny Habits, mm -hmm. Small Things, Small Changes That Change Everything by, I think it's Forb. I don't remember his Tiny name. Tiny Habits, okay. Yeah, it's called Tiny Habits, Small Changes That Change Everything. It talks about how uh, for any change to happen, there needs to be motivation, like you want to do it, uh, which is like a why. Um, there needs to be ability, and also sometimes there needs to be something that triggers mm. the change. And then you need to make changes in small steps. It's more sustainable than 
just waking up and wow. thinking I'm someone else. So those are the three books. Great books. books. I mean, the Bible I read every day. Um, the two books, the other two books we've yeah. mentioned, I haven't read. So I must I must get hold of them. Yeah, th thank <laughs> you, you so should. much. Maud, thank you so much for creating the time to be in conversation with Trevor. Allow me now to tend to our viewers who are all over the world. Uh, thank you for supporting in conversation with Trevor. Remember, we are a weekly show. We are out on YouTube at 7 a.m. Central African time every Monday. To ensure that you don't miss out on any of these quality conversations, I invite you to click on this red button and subscribe. If you subscribe, you receive a notification from YouTube every time we have one of these quality conversations. And we've gone a step further. Scroll down below this video. We've got a link uh, to a podcast for your listening pleasure. We read your comments. Until next time, thank you all for watching and cheers.